And so right there from your home, I want to invite you to sing with us, to celebrate as we lift up the King of Kings. Christ the Lord is risen today. Sons of men and angels say Alleluia. Raise your joys in triumphs high. Alleluia. Sing ye heavens and earth reply. again our glorious King. Alleluia. Where, O oh, death is now thy sting. Alleluia. the power of sin and darkness his love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the holy with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you take my place. That you bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be
Philippians chapter 2 says this about Jesus. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You were the word of the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation now revealed and you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful
God, we thank you today for the hope, the living hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And God, we don't just have a hope of a future with you, of ultimate healing, but we have the promise of your power, of your presence, of your peace with us right now. And none of that would be possible without the love of Jesus and without a Savior who rose from the dead, who defeated death once and for all. We are so grateful for that today. We thank you for this hope. We pray that you would help us to lean into this hope a little bit more today and to walk in this hope this year. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, everybody. Happy Easter. He is risen risen indeed. Welcome to church. This is Boulder Creek Community Church. My name is Adam, and I just want to welcome you, whoever you are, wherever you are, and whenever you are. This is truly a, an unusual Easter celebration as Christians are gathered all over the world in homes. Churches, maybe for the first time since the early days of the church, are empty all over the world. But we are gathered today because the tomb is empty. And that is the reason that we are celebrating and that is the reason we live even today with a tremendous sense of hope. Now, we are going to walk through John chapter 20. Jesus has just been crucified 
Saturday is gone and it is in the early hours of Sunday morning. And in John chapter 20, we see that Jesus appears on three different occasions. He appears to a woman named Mary, and then he will appear to the disciples minus one. And then finally, he will appear to Thomas, the famous doubting Thomas. But I have brought in from the past, and you can do this nowadays with technology, a very special guest to read the scriptures for us this morning. And you will probably recognize his voice if you're over 40 years old. His name is Johnny Cash, and he is going to read the first section for us today. Chapter 20. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead, then the disciples went away again to their own homes. Before we get started, I want to say a prayer for our time together, but also for many of our uh, nurses, our doctors, our grocery store clerks, and many others who are putting themselves at high risk because of their jobs. And so if you would bow your heads and close your eyes wherever you're at, unless you're driving, and let's pray. God, thank you so much for your sovereignty in this life and in this universe. God, we know that you are not caught off guard by COVID-19 and that somehow, even if it doesn't make sense to us, you have good for us in the midst of this. And so I pray for our national leaders, our state leaders, our local leaders as they make big decisions that affect millions of people's lives. And I pray, God, that they would have the wisdom to make decisions that bring about the most good for the most amount of people. And that the decisions would also be made in such a way that glory would be given to you. And God, I pray for our nurses, our doctors, our grocery store clerks, and many other professions, God, that where they are interfacing with people and putting themselves at high risk and their health. And so God, just protect them and guard them. And I pray God that our doctors and that our scientists would come up with a, a solution uh, for COVID-19 and that millions and millions of lives would be spared. And then finally, God, I wanna ask you just to be uh, with us in our time of study, that you would bring uh, comfort, God, to those who are brokenhearted uh, today. I pray you would bring courage, God, to those who are afraid and maybe living with a sense of anxiety and fear. And then, God, for those of us who have fallen, who have failed, or um, God, that you would restore us to yourself and remind us of why we are here and who we are and the purpose that you've given us in this life. And so bless your word and help us to learn today, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, I have had the privilege to visit all kinds of churches around the world. I have been in small house churches that were secret churches in Syria. I visited once the 5th century ruins of a ch massive church in the Middle East. I have been in a massive church that was embedded in the cliffs of a hill in the Cairo dump. 
in this church, uh, you would not only have thousands of people that lived in the Cairo dump attend this church, but you'd also have people that lived in very wealthy parts of town drive their Mercedes Benz through the dump and attend church. Um, I, I've been in small churches with dirt floors where barely 30 people could squeeze in in the outskirts of small towns in the Philippines. I've been in dozens of different churches all across different countries in Africa and in many churches even in Mexico. And I'll tell you, it is nothing new. It is nothing unusual for Christians to be gathered in homes. Today, there will be more Christians in China who gather in secret and in homes than there will be Christians in all of Europe and America combined gathered together to worship God and to celebrate the fact that the tomb is empty. Christianity really is a movement like none other in history. Christians, you might say, are like cockroaches. They just will not go away. Karl Marx termed Christianity as an opiate of the masses, a tool of exploitation. Sigmund Freud called Christianity an illusion, a crutch, a source of guilt for pathologies. Bertrand Russell said, I say quite deliberately that the Christian religion, as it organized in its churches, has been this, and still is the principal enemy of moral progress in the world. And then maybe you've heard of this guy, Gregory House, M.D., he once said in one of the episodes of House, rational arguments don't usually work on religious people, otherwise there would be no religious people. Now I am guessing that some of you may have a real problem with Easter. Maybe someone sent you the link to this video because they love you and they care for you. But you're not necessarily an antagonist toward Easter, but you don't really buy into it fully. You have hang-ups, perhaps, maybe they're intellectual hang-ups, maybe they're more emotional hang-ups, or maybe you have come across Christians that are weird or odd, or even worse, highly hypocritical and judgmental. Well, I've got good news for you. I've got good news for you. Easter has nothing to do with Christians. In fact, let me say this, Easter is the only reason that some 2,000 years later, Christians, which number in the billions, and by the way, Christian was the name given to Christians by non-Christians, and it meant little Christ. And Easter is why little Caesar's is just a pizza. 2,000 years later. There is no plausible reason that on a normal Sunday, without all this lockdown and sheltering in place, that on a normal Sunday there will be more Christians in America gathered to worship Jesus than there will be Americans that attend Major League Baseball games for every team for an entire season. Even as Christianity seems to be on the decline in the Western world, it is absolutely exploding in South America, in Asia, and especially in China where it is illegal. But you know where it's growing the fastest in the last few years? Imagine this, in refugee camps in the Middle East. When you look at how the Christian movement began, there is no plausible reason that it should still exist today. Maybe you can relate to Doubting Thomas. Jesus has one of his appearances with Doubting Thomas present. Thomas refuses to believe that Jesus has risen from the dead. Some of the women have told him, some of the disciples, the other ten disciples still alive, have been convinced and are trying to convince Thomas, and he says, absolutely not. Listen to what he says in John chapter 20, beginning in verse 24. 
But Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands. And reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Look, I want to say to you, if you find yourself at times doubting the Christian message, doubting the existence of God, whatever it may be, I want to tell you that you are in good company. Even one of Jesus' closest friends doubted. I will say this to you. It is not a sin. It is not wrong to have honest doubts. I want you to notice that when Jesus presented himself to Thomas, he didn't bash him. He didn't give him a guilt trip. He didn't make him feel ashamed. He simply invited him. Go ahead, Thomas. Touch my wounds in my side. Touch the wounds in my hand. But I want you to see how Thomas responds. My Lord and my God. I want you to consider for a moment some things from this chapter 20 of John. If you are a person who maybe struggles with intellectually buying into the church, to the gospel, to Christianity. I want you to consider uh, three things. First of all, consider that the very first eyewitnesses of Jesus were women. John records only the encounter to Mary, but Luke, the parallel passage, says that there were actually three women. In fact, all four gospels of Jesus record that women made their way to the tomb with burial spices. See, women knew that what men started, they needed to finish. In Luke chapter 24, verse 11, it says this, and this is the disciples responding to the women who said, the tomb is empty. They did not believe the women. Why? Because their words seemed like nonsense. See, even in the first century, women were not allowed to testify in a court of law. Their testimony was not considered valid or reliable. About 80 years after Jesus died, there was a historian, a Greek um, pagan philosopher named Celsus. And he absolutely hated Christianity and he hated Christians. And he wrote often against the Christian faith. In one of his books called The True Word, this is what he wrote. One of the reasons we know Christianity cannot be true is because the accounts of the resurrection are based on the testimony of women. And then he follows that up with this. And we all know that women are hysterical. If you were making a story up in the first century, you would never rely upon the testimony or eyewitness of a woman. The only possible reason that women are included in all four of the Gospels as eyewitnesses is because this is what actually happened. Again, if you wanted people to believe your story, you would never count on the testimony of a woman. Consider, secondly, that even his closest followers, his disciples, were confused and afraid. Even after being told repeatedly, not only how he would die, but that on the third day, he would rise again. And how come not one of the disciples said, hmm, he told us on the third day he would rise again. 
let's go take a look. Not even one person considers it. You see, when you look at the details, the disciples who had been told over and over and over, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise again on the third day, they never expected it. They thought the body, in fact, had been moved or stolen, and they thought that they were actually seeing things when Jesus appeared to them at first. And, of course, they thought the women were crazy. The truth is the disciples come across in the Gospels as bumbling idiots. And if you wanted people to believe your story, you would never make yourself the protagonist. My kids have been binge-watching Star Wars on this shelter in place and I can't imagine anyone, anyone who's a Star Wars fan, watching Star Wars and going, oh, that Darth Vader, man, I want to be like him. Finally, consider this, that believing in the resurrection in the first century was nearly impossible for both Romans and Jews. Romans, of course, believed in a spiritual resurrection, kind of a quasi new birth but Jews especially to believe that a man would be risen from the dead was very very difficult to accept and to worship God as a man was so outside of their way of thinking it made it nearly impossible to accept C.S. Lewis talks about cultural snobbery and it's the idea that where we in our 21st modern scientific culture kind of look down our noses at other ancient cultures especially, and we see them as, as ignorant, as simpletons. But you got to understand, these people, they didn't have low IQs just because they didn't have all the modern science and modern technology that we have today. It did not mean that they were idiots. In fact, I would argue that if you think modern science and medical technology and, and iPhones make us smarter, try watching The Tiger King. Are you with me? Look, the world view of Jewish people in the first century made it nearly impossible to believe this. And even after Jesus over and over said on the third day, on the third day, on the third day, they still couldn't buy it. Let me say to you, if you are looking for a place or if you know someone who would be willing to meet in a small group. I'm going to call it a Thomas group. My wife and I, as soon as this is over, we're going to open up our home and we're going to invite people to come to our house once a month. And this is a place where they're not going to get a lecture. It's not going to be a monologue. It's going to be a dialogue. I don't claim to have all the answers. But it will be a place where there will be no question that will be considered too simple. And no question will be considered too hostile. If you have honest doubts and you are willing to get together and just discuss those doubts and express those doubts, no judgment, no pressure, um, I want to invite you to email me. Here's my email address. It is adam at bccchurch.org. And you can also call me or text me. My phone number is 408 429-0725. I live in Scotts Valley, and, and so I am looking forward if you are interested in being a part of this group. And also, if you know someone that is interested, please let them know. In fact, you can attend this group only and only if your friend will only attend if you attend with them. And so I hope that you will Make a note and contact me, and I hope that I will get a few people at least that would be willing to attend this. I want you to see now what Jesus does for those who believe. First of all, and this is such a beautiful scene, we see Jesus and how he comforts Mary. Jesus comforts the brokenhearted. 
Listen as, once again, Johnny Cash reads John chapter 20, beginning in verse 11. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things to her. I love that. Mary is broken hearted. Three times it is mentioned that she is crying, she is weeping. Uh, and yet it's just at the mention of her name, when Jesus says, Mary, she immediately turns, she immediately recognizes that voice, and she knows who it is. I imagine that Jesus may have been the only man ever in Mary's life that was dependable. I imagine that Jesus was the only man in Mary's life that didn't use her and abuse her. And I imagine that Jesus was the only man that Mary had ever experienced in her entire life that loved her, loved her, and yet fully knew her. It's been said that one of our greatest fears is to be fully known. And yet at the very same time, one of our greatest desires in life is to be loved. And that is why some of us struggle in relationships. That's why there's sometimes so much conflict and why relationships can be so complicated. It's because we tend to hide. We tend to cover up those dark secrets, those places in our life that we really don't want anyone to know about. A few years ago, I had a conversation with a woman who had been divorced after 35 years. And she said this to me, you know, he never really let me in. There were places in his life where I was not allowed. Did you know Jesus knows your name? And not only does he know your name, he absolutely and fully knows you. There is nothing hidden from him. And yes, even though he absolutely and fully knows you, he loves you. He loves you as you are, not as you ought to be. And Mary experienced this incredible love with Jesus, a man who knew everything about her and yet fully loved her. Maybe you've experienced loss Maybe you've had your heart broken. Perhaps you live life with a bit of an edge. You've been hurt, you've been taken advantage of, and you've said, never gonna happen again. And so you live with this arm's length distance between you and everyone else, and you've told yourself, I'll never get hurt again, and I'll never trust someone again. The problem is, is when we live life that way, not only do we present, uh, prevent ourselves from being hurt ever again, we also tend to prevent people from truly loving us as we are. You know, I've learned over the years that as I have allowed the love of Jesus to be what I fully lean on, His approval, 
that I no longer need the approval of other people as much. I no longer need other people to love me as much. But yet, as I, as I have leaned into the love of Jesus and his approval, I have found that that has freed me up to actually love other people and be loved by other people better. And so Jesus comforts the brokenhearted. And maybe today you find yourself in a place where you could use the comfort of God. Well, it's because the tomb is empty. It's because Easter happened that you can experience the comfort of God. But we also see that because of Easter, because the tomb is empty, that he encourages the fearful. He encourages the fearful. Let's invite uh, our friend Johnny Cash one more time to read John chapter 20, verses 19 and 20. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Now when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Then Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Picture this scene with me. The disciples are on lockdown. They are afraid. They're afraid of the government, their religious leaders, who have just killed their leader. And why are they afraid now? Because they're potentially next. And so picture this scene. They are huddled in this room afraid. They're full of regret. They're full of doubt. They're feeling discouraged and even defeated. But in just a few days from now, these same disciples will leave full of courage and faith full of love and of hope, and they will be on a mission where, in fact, they will die for that mission. But they will turn the world upside down, and it will be changed forever. You know, my son, my youngest son, Johnny, 12 years old, loves to play Xbox, and every now and then, I will sneak up to the room, and I will jump into the room and go, hey! And of course, he just gets easily startled and his heart rate goes up and, and I'll walk away and 30 seconds later, I'll jump back and go, hey! And he might get a little startled, but then the third time I come back and I jump into the room and I scream even louder, hey! He rolls his eyes. Why? Because he's been there. <laughs> he knows he doesn't need to be afraid because he's faced it already. Look, have you been feeling uneasy these days? I know I have at times as well. But you know, we believe as Christians, we believe that even if the worst thing happens, even if death awaits us, Easter means, the empty tomb means, that there is life to come. And so because there will be life new life to come. We can live today with peace and with poise, and with courage and with hope. And so Jesus comforts the brokenhearted and he gives courage to the fearful. But finally, he also can restore the fallen because of the resurrection, because of the empty tomb. Jesus can restore even those who have fallen. Who have failed. One of the disciples betrayed him. He ended up committing suicide. Peter, we know, denied him three times and then yet went on to be one of the greatest disciples. And then others ran away at Christ's greatest hour of need. And then, of course, our favorite disciple Thomas, who doubted that he had even risen from the dead. Failure is something that we all face. It is something that we all have dealt with. But because of the resurrection, failure does not need to define us. 
Renee over at Twin Lakes sent me this story this week, and it's a story about a pastor who will describe what he calls the most emotional day of his life. It occurred the very first time he ever played Little League Baseball. All 60 of his relatives showed up to watch him play, and this is how he told it. I'll read it exactly as he tells it. My first ever Little League Baseball game. I was the least skilled on the team. I came up to bat three times and struck out every time. Seventh and the last inning, bases were loaded. Our team was behind by one run. I was up. I walked what seemed like 50 miles to home plate. I got up there scared, stiff, and shaking. I felt like 200 people on one side screaming for me to get a hit. And at the same time, 200 other people for the other side screaming for me to get a strikeout. The pitcher wound up. I didn't even see his first pitch. Whoosh! And I heard it hit the catcher's mitt. And I heard the umpire call, strike one. And then there was a second pitch, strike two. At that point, I said to myself, I got to get a hit. I'm going to get a hit. I actually started swinging during the pitcher's windup. The pitch came in. I saw it, and I swung as hard as I could, and I missed. And I heard the ball hit the catcher's mitt. And I heard the umpire say, strike three. You're out. Game over. A huge cheer erupted from the 200 people and an audible groan from the 200 other people. And I knew I had failed. And I felt like I was going to have to live with this failure for the rest of my life. I dropped the bat and I started the longest walk of my life to the end of the dugout. I sat down, pulled my hat over my eyes, and I sobbed for probably 15 minutes. I could hear the gravel underneath the car tires as people pulled out of the parking lot of that field in Iowa. Everything got quiet. And then I heard a noise from the pitcher's mound. A voice said, hey, get back up. Game's not over. I pulled up my cap and I looked out and there on the pitcher's mound stood my dad. He was wearing a mitt and holding a ball. And then I looked into the field. None of my relatives had left. They were all in the field waiting to play. Aunt Emma in left field, my nearly blind Uncle Joe in right. A bunch of toddlers in diapers waddling around the infield. I sheepishly walked over to the plate. Dad threw a pitch. Everybody started cheering. And I missed. He threw it again. I missed again. About 15 pitches later, my dad threw it right down the middle and whack. And I knocked it into left field. I stood at home plate and my dad said, what are you doing? Run! And so I ran down to first base. I'd never been there before. Just in time to see Aunt Emma the left fielder, throw the ball into center field. I thought, cool, I'm going to get a double. And I ran to second base just in time to see Todd, a pretty good athlete playing center field, throw the ball into right field. It was what I call now a conspiracy of grace to make sure that I got home safe. But at this point, all I knew was, I'm going to score. I rounded third and sprinted toward home. And when I got about 10 feet away, I dove, slid across, and jumped up. And then I saw him. About five feet in front of me, my dad. He'd gotten down on one knee and tears were streaming down his face. He held out his arms and said, Son, welcome home. Your safe. I threw myself into his arms and he picked me up and he whispered in my ear, 
I told you. I told you the game wasn't over. And this is what Jesus is doing for his disciples when he says, guys, game's not over. Get back in the game. And no matter how you may have failed, God says to you, get back up. The game's not over. This is what Jesus was saying when in John chapter 20, he says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Some of you feel like you don't have what it takes. You failed too many times. You're not good enough. Well, I've got good news for you. I've got great news for you. See, if Easter is true, if the tomb is in fact empty, then guess what? Guess what? God doesn't call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. And you're called. See, he brings us in and he gives us his love and his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness. And then he sends us out with his message of love and of hope and of redemption. And it is a message of second chances. At the very end of this chapter, John gives us the purpose for which he has written his gospel. And this is what he says. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these, these signs that you have just read about are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I can remember many years ago, I was 20 years old. My life was spiraling out of control. I had flunked out of church twice. I had dropped out of college twice. And I was now living in my car. And maybe that's why I enjoy doing my daily devos from my car. My theme song at the time was the Jay Giles band, Love Stinks. I was angry, I was lonely, I was lost. I knew the stories of Jesus. I had grown up in church. I had religion, but I was tired of the guilt and the shame and the condemnation that I felt from religion. But one day, and it was actually January 1st, 1986, at a Christian camp called Hume Lake, for the first time I understood the good news. For the first time, I understood Easter. For the first time, I understood that it wasn't about my performance, but it was about the performance of Jesus. For the first time, I felt loved. And for the first time, I understood his grace in my life. Let me ask you a question. Some of you perhaps have been Christians for years or even decades. I want you to do me a favor. Wherever you're at, whenever you're at, whoever you are, I want you to text me the date of when you first got it, when you first understood the grace of Jesus Christ. Now, some of you, you might not remember an exact date. Maybe it's more of a season or even a decade in your life. Text me that. Here's my number again, 408-429-0725. Or if you want to email it to me, you can email it at adam at bccchurch.org. I would love to hear from you, and I would love to hear the story of when you first understood Easter. Now, for some of you, Perhaps you're not there yet, and that is okay. You are welcome in this place, and you are welcome to continue to tune in and to listen to the messages. But I want to invite you. I want to invite you, if you are ready, if today is that day, and that you understand that Jesus was the atoning 
sacrifice for your sins and that he died the death that you deserve and that he offers the life that he lived an empowered resurrected life then i want to invite you to say a very simple prayer i call it the thomas prayer it's a prayer that i prayed back in 1986 my lord and my god it is a prayer of surrender it is a recognition of who Jesus is and who he is for you. And so right where you're at, wherever you're at, whenever you're at, say a simple prayer. God, you are my Lord. And I surrender my life to you. I invite you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. And give me a new start. Heal my broken heart. Empower my, me to overcome my fears and my failures. And I will live my life for the rest of my days for you and for your kingdom. Man, if you pray that prayer, uh, and you can pray it in your own way and in your own words, it is a simple prayer of surrender. Man, I would love for you to let me know. Once again, text me or email me and let me know today. Today is the day that you understood Easter and that the, that the tomb was empty. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for each person who is listening to this video cast or podcast at this moment. And God, you love each person more than we can imagine. And because Easter is true, because the tomb was empty, God, you give us second chances. In fact, you give us third and fourth and hundredth and a thousandth chances. And your love will never change. And once we enter into that love and live in that love, God, we are promised that that love can never be taken from us. You will never forsake us. You will never give us up. And so, God, I want to pray for each person, God, that is hearing this message, that they will grasp in a new way, in a fresh way, and perhaps in a deeper way, God, how great your love for us is. And God, from this day forward, I pray that we would live with all of the hope and all of the love and all of the courage and all of the mission that you have invited us to and that we will be people who make a difference in this world as we live for you in Jesus name and all God's people said amen God bless you all thank you so much for listening to this message and we are going to close with some worship so I invite you just to listen in pay attention to the words and let your heart connect to the heart of God. God bless you all.
Children and the children and the children. 